How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. You might not know this, but before I record an episode, I like to break a sweat. And I do that using the Chop Fit. Over the course of the past year, the Chop Fit has allowed me to lose weight, tone up my body, and feel even more amazing about myself. A feeling that you should all feel about yourself as well. If you use this code, SpearChop10, you get $10 off your order. Once again, use code SpearChop10 for $10 off your Chop Fit order. It'll change your life. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk, and today we got two wonderful guests. Uh, most of you should recognize Josh. Uh, Josh, who I served in the government with, lover of all things cryptozoology, werewolves, skinwalkers, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster. Glad to have you back here, Josh. And today we're welcoming our really special guest, uh, Lyle Blackbird. Uh, Lyle is an author, producer, singer of the, the band Ghoul Town. Uh, he's been on every single TV show. And the author of some incredible books to include the Boggy Creek Case Book and Sinister Swamps, uh, which are the only two I've had, but the other ones have actually been on back order on Amazon. So uh, you can grab all his stuff on Amazon. And, uh, but uh, Lyle, it's great to be out here today with you. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, so the reason why I want you on here, obviously, Josh and I have this love of all things Bigfoot, werewolves, and all that. But Anything with hair. Before- Anything, anything with hair, <laughs> but for you, before we kind of jump into your career and some of the work you've done and some of the research is amazing. How did you kind of, as a child, is it, was there any catalyst or stuff that kind of led you down this path? Like how did you kind of become like this? Well, I would consider you a staple now in this genre and horror in, in general itself. Well, I mean, it was just something that I was born with, I guess. Um, as far back as I can remember, I loved horror movies and, you know, anything on TV that had vampires and werewolves or ghosts. I just love that stuff. And sometime in elementary school, they passed around this little thing where you could order scholastic books. And I got one called Strange But True. And it had stories of Bigfoot, Yeti, Loch Ness Monster, and other real, just weird stuff, you know. And I was like, whoa, this is really cool because this is like monsters that could exist, you know. And they, you know, those type things were, you know, far away from where I lived in Texas. You know, it's like I I wasn't going to convince my parents to take me to Scotland or anything like that. So (laughs) then I, I, by some miracle, my parents took me to a drive in and we saw the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek back in the 70s sometime when I was really little. And that really did it for me because it dramatized sightings of a Sasquatch-like creature in southern Arkansas, only about three hours from where I lived in North Texas. And so that that right there just kind of put together the the scary, the horror, the the cryptids, real life monsters. and, And I've just been fascinated ever since, you know, not it was later that I just sort of just sort of got into this more seriously and professionally but you know it's just been something uh, i've been a lifelong fan now going through yeah. school though were you always big into the notes and the research because the work you've done specifically for the boggy creek stuff with the case studies and working with these other groups to research and interviews did this type of passion you had for this stuff help you actually in life through school and stuff like that when it came to research and reading and all that too Well, I I never really thought of of it in terms of I could do any kind of research. You know, when I was younger, I just liked the subject and just would read books or, you know, whatever. And and I never thought even a clue that maybe I could actually go and research. But the thing that did help me is I was always good at writing and in music, and, and I've kind of been a professional musician slash writer in some form or another my whole life. So the the writing part uh, really helped when I came to the point of, well, I want to research these things. I want to write a book about what was true about the legend of Boggy Creek, which is kind of where I started in the research phase. And then, you know, having, you know, a having done professional writing, then those skills came in to kind of catapult me into documenting and researching. Yeah, John, we were, and me, we were talking a little bit about that in the pre-show of uh, 
kind of how what differentiates you and, and some of the other people working in the field it's just uh you kind of focus on what i consider more interesting which is a lot of those local monsters like that local folklore and and some of that touches on you know national stuff like bigfoot things things you could find anywhere in the woods but the level of research you've done uh with uh, local cases as far as old newspaper articles, eyewitness stuff, the interviews you did for Boggy Creek, they're they are really interesting. Um, what kind of led you to focus on the more local stuff, uh, considering that, as you said earlier, you were kind of into anything paranormal and cryptid early on with, with movies and whatnot, like like we all, we all were? I think, you know, and, and kind of kind of launched from the Boggy Creek thing where the creature was essentially a Bigfoot. I mean, it's described as seven foot tall, covered in hair and walked upright on two legs. But because it had a movie and it was called the Boggy Creek Monster, it seemed to have more personality than just sort of generic Bigfoot. And after I researched that case, I just really appreciated how the local flavor played into the story and the, even the sightings of that creature. So when I went forward working on other books and things, I kind of continued in that format where I would talk about the place where it was cited and, and look for cases that had a bunch of newspaper coverage and maybe had a name, you know, the lizard man or the Sabine mm -hmm. thing or uh, whatever the name was. It just seemed right. to be more cool and almost creepy and scary and regionalized than just sort of tackling Bigfoot as a whole. Yeah, I, I think yeah, the more the more regional or the more localized those those old newspaper reports, especially prior to people wanting to fake this kind of stuff, are are really interesting. Um, it, out of everything you've looked into, is there anyone you would say is uh, like most credible or more credible? As far as the creatures. Yeah, just as far as like what you found, uh, you know, local evidence that was collected, or or just anything in research that's. You know, uh, like a Mothman is is as horrifying as some of the stories come out for that. Like the evidence is kind of uh, more specific to like West Virginia or something like that. Right. You know, I think that the you know Bigfoot has seems the most possible to exist. It has the most physical evidence with the footprints, some you know unknown hair, as well as obviously thousands and thousands of sightings many of them reported by people who you know there's these aren't crazy hillbillies these are people who have military backgrounds biologists you know everyday people um and many of those have you know i've interviewed those types of people and you know i just can't explain what they saw they saw something and they saw something they couldn't explain um you know, the, there's various Bigfoot cases, obviously the Boggy Creek case, I've looked into it so much that I can just sort of go, well, all these people aren't making this up. And there's a few of those people that had really ironclad sort of sightings where it was like, well, they're not mistaking this and they're not making this up. Um, there's been other cases where, say, in Georgia, there's there's an area called Elkins Creek where a deputy sheriff cast a pretty darn good print um, out of there. That's more like Georgia Bigfoot, but that's a really mm -hmm. good cast. Um, when you start getting into things like river monsters or lake monsters and stuff, I mean, there's less sort of the physical evidence. You're just kind of going by anecdotal stories something like the lizard man, you know, it's going down this, that gets into just what in the world could this be? Because the biology of something that's reptilian yet stands upright like a man that's seven feet tall, you know, you can almost try to explain Bigfoot and convince your uncle that it's probably real. But when you start telling him lizard man, right. Yeah. You're from the black lagoon, you know, yeah, <laughs> that's more of a blooper reel special. Or it starts getting harder. Now that doesn't mean the story is not just as engaging and cool and creepy because that's me. You know, I love the story and the phenomenon of it. Um, and when you get into stuff like Mothman, you know, now you play in UFO sightings and men in black and what evidence, you know, there's no footprints of Mothman. 
th those just become harder and harder to rationalize in simple terms. Not that they don't exist, just that those are harder. So, you know, for me, Bigfoot and the various regional versions of it are at the top of the list. And then there's some, you know, other cryptids descending down the list. What I loved about the Boggy Creek casebook book is I'm, I'm big into research. I love note taking. I love just digging deep into old interviews and stuff. And Josh brought up a good point earlier where he's kind of like the idea that you do new research on old cases. And I think that's something really unique that you do because you go back and interview these people again, or you go back and research where they saw this and take pictures. And for you, how exciting is it for you when you go back and talk to these people? Does this help invigorate kind of your passion for this? Or are you just trying to try to maybe just figure out what exactly these people all saw? Well, you know, I, I, I'm excited by it because if it's something that was documented in the newspapers, and Josh talked about this a little bit and said, that was kind of before, you know, everybody's got a Facebook Bigfoot group now and, you know, everybody wants to have an experience. Back then, people, uh, they, they didn't really want to tell anybody they had seen a giant ape in the woods. People think they're crazy. It, it just not as accepted as now when you've seen 10 seasons of finding Bigfoot and you're like, well, right. <laughs> those people are just like me. They don't seem crazy, you know? Yeah. So I think those old cases say something in that, you know, obviously there's a history of this going on and those cases, sometimes all the dots was, were never connected. You know, they'd be run some in the newspaper and then nobody really like a Bigfoot researcher or a cryptid researcher didn't interview them. It was just journalists. So if I can go back, especially if I can find the people or maybe the son of the woman who saw it and get the full story and then all of a sudden connect it to not only the other sightings that were reported in the news, but some others that never were. And there's mm. like, oh, wow, you put this together, you go, there's something to this. You know, all these people saw this. Um, and, and I just love kind of that vintage feel kind of goes with my how I like the regional cases just that kind of 1970s monster thing you know yeah <laughs> the classics right behind you <laughs> yeah right like that um yeah so I'll go into I, I mean we're getting into the best season of the year for me the Halloween season obviously and uh, I was I was creeping on your Instagram here and, and you kind of started talking about uh some of the werewolf legends and lore stuff you've done separately um you know, what, what do you, what do you kind of give to that as far as relevancy, like, uh, like anthropy, you know, it, it's, it's historical goes back to Europe, you know, with foundations in, in, you know, Roman, uh, you know, mythology. Um, do you think that it, it, it's something that's somewhat credible or is it more important to folklore than it has been to science? Is it kind of like a warning versus, uh, something more credible? Yeah. I mean, it the the whole werewolf, werewolf thing i mean there's kind of two aspects to that you know the traditions of werewolves and and the dates back to all these cultures previously of sort of a shape-shifting or a human that becomes a wolf and then you have the the sort of cryptozoology cryptid version which is dogman which doesn't really propose that that creature was once a human, it, it's just this bipedal wolf or something, this incredibly large wolf. So, um, you know, obviously I put more credence in, in a dog man than I do werewolves. Um, you know, I love all that. I love the movies and the wolf man's one of my favorite films. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think the archetype of the werewolf often kind of gets thrown in when people see a dog man, but, we got to separate the two from supernatural versus an aberration or sort of an animal that's, you know, like what, like Hogzilla or whatever. There's this right. Wolfzilla. <laughs> yeah. You know, some people don't even say it walks upright. It's just these giant wolves or just weird stuff. Um, and, and, and dog man is, there's a lot of sightings now. It's kind of become a, I don't know, in vogue to see a dog man. I mean, mm you know, 10 years ago, I'd get some of those reports and there's, there's a history of it that I've studied and cases, same thing as like, I've looked at with Boggy Creek and others. Um, but now it's like, 
dogman groups and dogman investigation societies. So everybody's kind of focused in on that, but, mm. but I think there's some credible sightings and I've interviewed some people that are like, it looked like a werewolf. I don't know how to, right. what else to tell you, you know? Yeah. Now, yeah. You did. Sorry. I was going to say you did some narration and one of my favorites was uh, the Bray road beast. Um, I love watch. I've watched that probably 15 times on TV, cool. but uh, I mean, that's, that's a very convincing case to me because that has a lot of support from what the local community uh and it seems like it was well known locally well before you know it, it kind of got outside of there so do you have any thoughts on that that case being a little more credible than some of the other stuff we've heard yeah i mean i think uh, the bray road case El near elkhorn wisconsin um ha has some good things to it first there's a lot of credible witnesses that saw this and then you had you have Linda Godfrey, who was in the right place at the right time to kind of, you know, continually research and interview these people. And Linda is a very well balanced, you know, person. She's not trying to convince you of it or convince you it's not. She's just simply looking into it from a investigative journalist point of view, which is kind of what I do. Hmm. And uh, the fact that she collected all that and put this stuff connected the dots, it makes that case very credible. I mean, hmm. I literally have no doubt people saw some kind of wolf like creature that to this day we can't quite explain. And then the popularity, you know, that was sort of the launching point for the dog man thing is as people began to realize, well, it's not just Bray Road, there's sightings in. Michigan and Pennsylvania. And I mean, there's been a ton in the South too. Hmm. I, I don't want to assume that the viewers, uh, a lot of our listeners obviously know who Loch Ness, Bigfoot, like werewolf type stuff, but for a dog man, what is the, what are the characteristics of what you've come across in research, what the dog bed actually looks like? The, the general description of a dog man is a canid, which is like a wolf, sometimes described as a dog or a hyena, just some strange looking dog or wolf that has the ability to stand upright on two legs that can walk bipedally for a certain distance. Sometimes they're on all fours a little bit and they stand up or sometimes they're just seen running across the road on two legs. They're usually, you know, they, they have the, the long muzzle, the snout, um, hair, paws are sometimes described as having almost like pseudo hands yeah. and uh, you know that obviously creates a puzzle because wh why would a four-legged right you know digit grade animal get up and walk on two legs but people see it and and so it obviously it's sort of you think werewolf some people go i don't know how to describe it other than it looks like looked like a werewolf as a when it comes to yourself as a researcher is it what's tougher for you to kind of research actual video footage or pictures or something audio or uh sonic type footage like how do you kind of i mean obviously one or the other is great but if you can combine both probably even better but what's the disparity between whenever we see a picture of a Bigfoot, like the Patterson case, like you see that, or you see this the latest one this past week, Josh, where the guy in Idaho caught a picture of a Bigfoot mm. or walked in or the, the stuff, the videos you hear, the, of the making noises in the woods and the pictures, like how is it that we haven't yet, as a researcher, does that bother you that we have yet to actually capture proper audio or video of something like this? Yeah, of course. That, that poses a problem, especially the longer it goes. You know, the Patterson-Gimlin film is over 50 years old, and there's very few that have come even close to that. Um, but, you know, you can dismiss a lot of those pictures and videos because they just, they're grainy. People like, you have to circle it. It, it could be a shadow or anything. I'm not saying it's not a Bigfoot, but it's like, you know, it's not that easy to get like go try to film a wolverine or whatever i mean they can do it but if you just took a if i just walked like if you, us three went out there like we're not really wildlife biologists where do we start looking wolverines exist and they're they're super hard to capture on film um 
Bigfoot being the same way. So, and, and of course with the internet, you know, you, there's so many people trying to laugh this off or hoax it or throw, you know, a bone out there and Bigfoot researchers jump on it for a while until they realize that it's not credible or it doesn't help us. Um, you know, I get a lot of audio clips, but of course they're just sort of unidentified things. You don't actually see a Bigfoot making the noise. So all you can do is speculate that, well, I don't know what other kind of animal it is. Maybe it's a Bigfoot, but you know, that's not going to prove anything. Um, so, you know, I think ultimately Bigfoot is, they're few and much more few and far between than people realize. They're much harder to get on camera. It's not that easy. And I mean, people say, well, there's all these game cameras that are out there. Well, there's been a study. There was a study some years ago that uh, proved that alpha male coyotes could sense the cameras and would actively avoid them. And this was a real study. I mean, if a dumb old coyote can sense this and avoid it, perhaps something with more intelligence can sense something in the woods that doesn't belong and will just go around it. Right. So that's, you know, we just have to say, well, there's a possibility exist it exists and just because we hadn't proved it doesn't mean it doesn't exist i guess yeah i've done some reading about you know how the i didn't know about the wolf study that's interesting i'll have to look that up but about you know the infrared uh light them being able to detect it in a wavelength and it's like you said it's odd to them so they'll avoid it uh or some other stuff with uh, infrasound like with some of the audio recordings it's like you know, some stuff is not uh, easily discernible because it's like you don't know what that is. But then they've had other recordings where there's like an infrasound layer to it where they're like there's only certain like apex predators can make that certain sound. And I find those more interesting. But unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know. The field isn't big enough to really investigate all those. So but hopefully it gets there. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to those amazing animals. People, you know, want to attribute all these supernatural powers to Bigfoot, but man, animals, we're just still learning about yeah. communication between dolphins and um, look at what octopuses can do. <laughs> Even something as simple as a chameleon, when we see it changing color, the thing just changed colors. So, you know, there's all these things that, you know, this creature could have at its command, you know, from blending into the environment I mean, you know, shade, the shading of the fur is, it's on purpose, it's to camouflage. And if it's trying to hide, uh, or if it has some kind of ultrasound or sense, senses the, uh, the IR on a camera and all this other stuff, that would be just an extremely hard thing to go into the woods and just get on film. Mm. Now, when you do research, and obviously you do a ton of it, how receptive of other groups are uh, like, say, I know obviously you've worked at the Texas Bigfoot Research Center um, in the Boggy Creek case book, and you reference them a lot. And obviously they've been receptive to you looking at their research and stuff. But is there, is there a part of that, this life you're in where these different groups are very guarded with their information? And they want to be the first people to find the stuff and they don't want someone like you not kind of just digging around in their research like how do you kind of navigate your way through these different groups that may be guarded for the information they have um i've always tried to play neutral to to that and not play into group politics i mean i understand that when you're investing a lot of time and you have a group and a camaraderie you know you, if, right. if your goal is to prove bigfoot then yeah you might want to be the ones to do it. And so you got to be careful of somebody coming in and just taking all your hard work. Um, I've been lucky enough that most of the groups, like just about any group, I could probably call up and say, hey, can I go out with you? And they would say, okay, because they, they know me personally. They know I'm not trying to heist their group, right. steal their stuff. I all, if I am trying to document some, I always provide the source, you know, you know, tell about them or whatever, it, it helps everybody. And so I, you know, I try to, I belong to every group, but I belong to no group. I just like the subject of Bigfoot. And if somebody else likes it too, then we have a common 
uh, meeting point, whether they're in a group or they're not in a group. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I've always been curious. Like, obviously, you do a lot of, a lot of those conventions with Ted Gearhart and these other people that are out there in this world. It's always, I've always been fascinated by, especially this genre where it's people always, if the, the guy, the girl that gets that first real picture or finds this thing, or it's going to be, it's going to change the world. And so I've always been curious about like the ego and stuff backstage or those meetings where you guys are kind of like, oh, I wrote this book, but I wrote this book, but it seems like you're the type of guy that at the end of the day, let's all help each other, um, put the time in, put research, work together, and maybe we could help solve some of these cases. Yeah, I find that among my colleagues from Ken Gerhard to Dr. Jeff Meldrum and Lauren Coleman and um, all the guys, you know, in these various um, Bigfoot groups, in general, you know, no, no, everybody doesn't say, well, I did this or I did that, you know, they're very willing to share as long as they get to know you and know you're a, you know, a honest person i think right. and so That's you cool. need to it's like with anything i try to prove myself i don't go in there i just i'm just looking you know to to kind of if i'm documenting a particular case i'm, I'm uh, they understand i want to get all of it you know not just part of this this side of it i need everything and then i'm pl you know i'm giving credit and nobody really fights among the people that i know and the ones that end up in the fights and all that usually get on the fringe with not just mm. me or somebody but the whole group <laughs> and it's you know there's usually a common denominator with that right yeah. when you've been out there um with some of those groups or or even if you've been by yourself i don't know if you've ever done any solo research have you run in a kind of like any scary moments or anything that kind of made you a second guess choosing that particular uh you know creature or, or lore to follow up on uh and if so has the monster sauce come in handy <laughs> well, I've only had the monster sauce out for a short period of time, so I've never actually been able to, you know, offer it to a cryptid in exchange <laughs> for not eating me. But he'd probably just take the monster sauce and put it on me and then eat me. Delicious. Anyway, but um, yeah, I mostly go, you know, I don't do a lot of group research. I mean, I, I'm more just kind of go, most of it is is me and one or two other guys that I kind of roam with um, and then maybe just some individuals so I don't do a lot of going to the woods with big groups or anything um, I've done that with a, a little bit but uh, yeah there's been some weird stuff um, that's happened you know I'm, I'm pretty fearless I, I grew up hunting with my father since I was little he was a bow hunter and we were always out somewhere and back Back in those days, we had no GPS, no phone. He, he didn't believe in compasses or <laughs> anything. I mean, I don't know how we didn't just get lost in the woods forever. And uh, But uh, we were, several years ago, myself and my late friend, Tom Shirley, who I did a lot of research in the Boggy Creek area, we were up there and we would take the canoe and put it into the bayou. It's an area called Mercer Bayou, which is... I mean, it looks like a, a primordial swamp, you know, the, the cypress trees and the Spanish moss and there's stuff slithering and crawling all through there. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of alligators and we would put the canoe in and paddle up at night um, because, you know, we we're literally the only people out there and it kind of isolated us and we could listen and, and look around. It's just cool. It was about midnight or thereafter and we were paddling we hear this howl come up out of the woods over there and there's a lot of ambient noise there's frogs and insects and you know your the paddle and stuff so i stopped i'm like was that like the weirdest coyote you ever heard and he's like i don't think that was a coyote so luckily the thing did it again about a minute later and then we're just like whoa dude it sounds like this howling growling deep thing to a howl and then i'm like well that's you know i've heard millions of coyotes that's not a coyote it doesn't sound like a bird it sounds big well then it did it again and so now we you know he's trying to record it and we're trying not to make too much noise in the boat and uh it was really spooky because then you're like oh crap what are we doing out here in the, <laughs> the woods i mean we're just like no one really knows where we're at we're out here at midnight in a swamp 
there's an alligator, there's something howling. And so we wait and it doesn't do it again. So we ended up, well, finally we just turned around and paddled all the way back to where our camp was. You know, we're paddling, I mean, it makes some amount of noise and we get back and pull that canoe out where there's a hill. That's where we had our tent because down that bayou, you want to camp a little high, you know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. literally alligators. And we, we just got back up to the tent. I mean, it's a very small hill. And all of a sudden, brrr, this howl thing comes from right across the bayou channel where we just Oof. got out. And, and of course, it caught us off guard again. And I'm like, dude, it's the same thing. And so he's grabbing the audio thing. I grabbed, I mean, I had a flashlight right there. And I just kind of ran down the hill. And I was trying to shine it over there you know to see if i could see whatever it was because i mean thought what the hell is this my chance you know and and uh whatever it was ran off and then called again about 50 yards away within seconds and did this howl thing and then went further and howled again and it was super spooky and and then you're you know the adrenaline's pumping and and then you're just kind of like did that thing somehow follow us down the bayou? And I mean, how did it get right across from our camp? Uh, we can just presume that it followed us down there and howled at us. And then just, it probably when I made noise, it ran off. But that was pretty spooky and leads you to question your choice in careers. Oh, man. And did you guys stay the night or did you, <laughs> did oh, yeah. you get out of there? <laughs> no, no. We stayed. I mean, it's no, no problem. I mean, my friend, Tom, I mean, he was, I mean, this guy was the deal, you know, he, he did some, he, he was a trapper in Mississippi for a while and swamps and nothing. I mean, he, got not, he was fearless too. And I'm fairly fearless, but yeah, we're, we're too manly to admit we're going to run away. <laughs> so oh, man. We're stuck, you know, and, and those are the type of things. There've been other things. I was out in Florida where, I did another thing where I kind of chased something through the woods and, and I got kind of scared then cause I got way off down in there. I left my, this girl I was with Cindy and ran off down in there and I swear it was a skunk ape, but again, I couldn't quite get up on it. It just run ahead a little bit and I just, I couldn't see it in the brush. And then I thought, well, dude, if I keep going, I'm going to be lost. And then this, mm. I don't even know what I'm chasing here. So it gets scary. Mm. I love that uh, when this first started, you told us that you grew up is this love of movie monsters and TV shows and all this stuff. But for you to do a be a Joe Bob Briggs TV show or have Ghoul Town read a song for Elvira, like that for you has got to be something super awesome. Where it's like, man, you are not only you following your dreams, your passions, but those people that kind of inspired you, whether it was the movies or the TV shows, here you are head to head with them so can you kind of talk to us about that because i find that joe bob Briggs and elvira for me are like the top when it comes to this genre yeah i've somehow had this odd life or odd way of ending up uh, you know working with people that i was once a fan of and never even thought that would even be possible um you know like joe bob and 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 stuff and elvira approaching ghoul we ghoul town played at a horror convention and uh she was there and she approached us her manager loved the band and she approached us and said well maybe you could write a song like yeah we could do i can do that no problem i mean i'm basically a fan i can write about you and so we did that and they liked the song so much we ended up flying to hollywood and shooting a video for it because we had a mutual friend that uh we had worked with who she was a fan of his books and he was getting into directing and I knew him. So he directed it and made the video, but yeah, it's very surreal to when you're sitting there going, how am I in Elvira's car? I mean, I was even weirder than that. Sometime after the, they played her, uh, her first movie, mistress of the dark at the Alamo theater in, in Austin. And she invited me to come, watch it with her so i'm in a balcony watch sitting next to her watching a movie about her <laughs> and then joe bob briggs and there's all kinds of other weird stuff where like my favorite band is the misfits 
Yep. Ghoul Town was once playing in this double level venue where they had a bands upstairs and downstairs. And we we were headlining downstairs and they were playing, they were they hadn't played yet. They're playing upstairs and some and I'm singing or whatever, and somebody's pointing over there. And I'm like, I look over there and Jerry only, the basis for the misfits, is on stage because we're doing a cover of Ghost Riders in the Sky. He's over there singing. And I'm like, what? hell you know i just go well this is normal and we went ahead and played and he was just an instant fan of the band and it's like the misfits are my favorite band then i ended up getting to know all those guys and and then joe bob being on his show that that was my favorite show appearance ever just being there with joe bob and watching him in action and talking about the legend of boggy creek that was just so cool growing up like I, we had Joe Bob Briggs every night. We'd watch the Burbs or Critters or Mask of Overdrive, whatever the stuff was. And so he was part of my childhood growing up. But as I got older, it's cool to see Shutter TV do stuff, obviously, which you did with Joe Bob. But do you find that as as the years go by, that who's going to be the next Elvira? Who's going to be the next Joe Bob Briggs that kind of fuels people's passions for, sure, the movies, entertainment, but the real type stuff like Boggy Creek and stuff like that? Yeah, you know, I, I have thought about that. Um, you know, who, who are those up and coming? And, and let me say that they they are of a professional level that is not average. I, yeah. I saw Joe Bob and now, you know, he writes the show and he's doing some of it, but a lot of that when he when he kind of says back to the movie and then he just starts talking that's that's not scripted none of that he's just going off and that dude is the smartest and he knows everything mm. i'm just sitting there in awe just like whoa and, and elvira as well she just you know in the video just do this do that she just of a level and and to try to figure out who who would fit in there and, and champion those kind of cheesy movies is hard to say i mean i'd volunteer for it but you know they're still the the kings of it so. right yeah yeah i almost feel like that genre was kind of like you know a drop in the hat of of you know the 70s to 80s that that monster movie classic uh, evolution and then it kind of fell away for a bit and it, it's coming back now as kind of like cult classics that uh you know if you and i were into it then you know so too our kids are going to be into it because we're going to make them watch that but i feel like maybe the mediums change to you know, there, there isn't going to be that host hosted night, you know, movie watching anymore. Instead, the new version is going to be a, like a YouTube channel or a podcast like this or something where, you know, it's people who grew up on that and they want to talk about that because the golden age of it has, has come. And in a lot of ways, it's still persistent, but newer stuff coming out with that classic feel, it's, it's hard to find. Uh, I don't know. I, I have, I have hopes, but you know, not, not that podcast and YouTube is a bad way to get the word out. I think it points people back to those classics, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's definitely going to take a shift here in the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love, I, I try not to think, Oh, I'm getting old because I keep going back to the classics, but actually I was back, I was doing the classics, when I was a kid already, I mean, I love Hammer movies yep. and the original um, well, Universal geez. Monsters, all the 50s and 60s monster movies and that 70s sort of thing that Rob Zombie really loves, obviously. Hmm. Um, but I think now it's like you don't have those sort of, you don't have those movies and you don't have those opportunities for those icons to have a nationally broadcast TV show. Now it's just spread across everything. You've got... Hmm a bunch of YouTube guys and you've got a bunch of different types of horror genres. It's just distributed now instead well, of focused like it was. To that point, when it comes to research and people, who's the next uh, Lyle Blackburn? Like, are you worried that you're going to do all this research and as you get older, you can't do the research, but who's in your wings? And if people want to jump out there into this type of research, do they reach out to someone like you or how do they get their feet wet to maybe find out, hey, I, I could be this next researcher. I could be this next person that goes out there. Well, I mean, people send, I get emails like, hi, I would like to, I would like to become a cryptozoologist that, or pursue that career. How would I do that? I'm like, 
first off, <laughs> no, don't do it. Second off, there is no accreditation for it. There's no, I don't know how to tell you to do it. I just, right. you know, it just kind of happen. In fact, I, people call me a cryptozoologist. I never really called myself that or even set out to do it. It's like, all, all I wanted to do is write scary books about people seeing real life monsters. And, but for lack of a better term, it's like, well, that's cryptozoology. So I just go with it. But, you know, for somebody to do it, I think they just have to find their own way. Like you can do research and you can, you know, publish it on the internet, straight to the internet, write books, do a podcast. There's all those different avenues to where all of a sudden, just like anything, if you do it, right. do it long enough and do it well, you'll rise to the top and people will notice, okay, this guy's really good or this girl. And uh, you, there's no real one set way. And I don't know who would follow me or whatever. Or, you know, I don't, I don't, can, unless I can't write and walk and use the phone or, I mean, I'd have to be it's right. pretty darn old before I'd quit doing this. I'm like, I can always write a book, you know, and I can always <laughs> use my voice, you know, or whatever. So what's, yeah. is it, what's your writing process between, is it different between writing a song for Ghoul Town or writing a chapter in a book? Like how, where do you kind of get ready? How do you get ready for one or the other? Yeah, they're two totally different things, really. Um, like for writing the books, I, I assemble all the data first usually before I start writing anything like I'll if I'm going to write about uh, a certain monster or whatever I'll try to find all the newspaper articles that might have existed I'll search the internet for any kind of blurbs or people posting about it um, collect all that if I can find some people to interview I'll call them you know, I'll go to that town and start poking around, you know, asking around and interview people. And, and then once I've kind of, you know, map out the chapters of the way I want the book to go, then I'll start writing it up. And I'm just sitting there, okay, first this happened, usually go chron chronologically. It's like there was this and these people saw it. And then this guy and I talked to this guy and, you know, and then I just roll it in there. So it's just sort of like a more scholarly journalistic thing right with the band it just sort of like i'll just get in a mood or a vibe to write suddenly pick up the guitar which is sitting over here you know there's always the guitars and i'll just mess around and write something and usually the song just kind of come out usually all at once like a whole entire album then i'll just focus on that for a while and and then i'll put the guitar down and i may not touch it for six months I just, right. I'm doing monster stuff and then all of a sudden it's like I didn't think I had any more songs but suddenly you know <laughs> but it's it's cool because I, I don't work for any I mean some of my books are on a publisher but they don't give me deadlines really or anything it's right. just I just do whatever I want and when I'm done with it then it'll come out and I like that I don't have any there's you know the songs are they'll be done when they're when I think they're done, the book, when I'm satisfied is done, that's when it's done by, you know, not trying to follow some boss or something telling me when to do it. Do you have Love some uh, research kind of like, or like documentaries or books that, that kind of fall into that same timeline of maybe you'll do some research on it and it'll kind of get put aside until you can get more material or until, you know, uh, you, you get a chance to kind of circle back on like more difficult to find leads uh, and then you'll, you'll finish it later. It kind of like your song uh, that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of the way it happens. You know, if I, you know, I kind of have, you know, folders of stuff. And if I see something that I think is cool or that might fit into something that I envision for the future, I'll go ahead and pursue it, you know, grab that newspaper thing or, call that witness and go ahead and record the audio but you know yeah it, it might just go over there because i don't really have enough for that right now and it, it's not what i'm i'm already working on this book but i'll file it over there and then yeah i could come back to it later you know yeah i mean it could be one year or five or six years 
you know, my Sinister Swamps book took me about 10 years to gather all that stuff. Wow. Just little by little in between and just putting it together. But it made a better book because if I'd have hurried, hurried to try to do it, I'd never get all those things into one find all those things from one area because it just takes time. And then you see another little thing and follow another thread, you know? Hmm. I love how you put together, just launched that uh, hot sauce stuff. So is that, obviously you're a fan of hot sauce, but how would you kind of put that together where this could be something cool that not only pushes your, your brand, I guess, but more uh, push the passion out there that we could, there's people out here looking for this stuff. Yeah, that I, I often have these kooky ideas where I suddenly, you know, will decide to, to, to do it. And the yeah. hot sauce was, it kind of was a combination of a guy did a, a kind of a I, black and white icon of me with a hat. And it looked cool, like a, like a, not like a cartoon, but an icon that you can see it's me. I had that. I was like, what can I do with that? You know, and then Elvira put out a hot sauce or, or somebody basically licensed her image. I saw that and had a little kind of icon of, I was like, you know, I could do a hot sauce. People don't real know, but I, I'm like a gourmet chef and I, I, I do, I cook and I'm self-taught. Um, before I was in on cryptid shows, I was actually going to launch a, a cooking show that's awesome the rock and roll cool. cooking show. I'm, I'm not kidding you this was kind of before that. that guy guy fieri won yes. that contest on the food network and he kind of became a sort of the rock and roll guy this was before that and i was going to have my musician friends come to my house and play like acoustically or something that was part of the show anyway so the hot sauce i just thought well i've got an icon i've got ideas for hot sauces and, and this and that and maybe i could find a somehow could figure out how to do it and uh so i just green lit the project and and did it just i don't know to no real intentions of like becoming a hot sauce mogul or anything but i know that it's cool and everybody eats hot sauce if i put that on my table when i'm doing a book signing people are like oh this is cool you know and i've been autographing bottles at at events <laughs> yeah no it looks good i'll have to get some for sure you mentioned uh, josh and i both are wondering the history of your hat it does look something that's so iconic like is this a hat that like what's the history of this hat uh that's another thing people ask me where did you get your hat where, where can i get one i'm like well this the, the hat actually came from mexico and this was when i started ghoul town I, I started the idea of Ghoul Town around 1997 and 98, and the band pretty much got launched in 99. And I had an idea of this wet, dark Western kind of thing, and I had another hat that was not quite this. Like, man, I need a hat. And at the time, I, I would go to I would go to Mexico frequently. Um, we would, I just fly down there and just wing it and go stay at these little places. Um, part of Yarta and other places and just hang out and so like well they have a lot of leather goods down there you know I'm like I could probably find something really cool so one time I was down there you know there it was and also a vest that I that I had I wore a lot on stage and uh you know it's just some handmade thing and I've been searching for a backup for 20 years like I'll go in I'll see even in El Paso, they had some similar hats. They just didn't look right on me. I don't know what it is or what. So now, now the hat is like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. insured. It's, I never let it out of my sight ever. Awesome. Never. It never, I don't put it on the bags that fly on the plane. It, it's on me. And you know, it's, it's like in my will that <laughs> must be preserved. <laughs> so it if is. you, if you and Ken Gerhardt are in the same room at the same time, which one has to lose the hat? Well, we <laughs> don't because you know why? It's because none of us can actually prove how young we were when we first wore a hat. Uh, I have a picture when I was three and I, I'm like this attitude and I'm wearing a 
it's like a brown hat at the time, but it's the hat. I'm like, dude, I was wearing hats at three. When he whips out a picture, he goes, I think I was three in this and he's wearing a hat. <laughs> it's a hat off. <laughs> it's a hat off. So it's, it's a draw. So we just. I've actually seen Ken though without his hat off and a lot of stuff like press and stuff, but you, it's like it's such a psychotic look. And it, I think it, it definitely is part of your uh, legacy for sure. I, yeah, and and I there for a while, like when I was Bigfoot, you know, I mean, it's like I don't wear this in the woods or whatever. I don't want to lose it, but you know, I would wear a baseball hat and stuff. And then after a while, it don't matter what I was doing or hat or no hat, people go, "Where's your hat?" So I'm like, you know, I'm just wearing the hat. And of course, in Ghoul Town, I wore it all the time yeah. because it was like the stage look. So I already wore it every time there, and then. I just, now it's like, even for a radio interview, I just wear the hat. Now, Ken, you know, he's been on a few shows that that convinced him or made him take the hat off. He doesn't yeah. like to do it either because that's his trademark. But I, I will walk off the set and they do it every time. They want to get me on the show and then they get to the set and they go, we want to go over something first. I, my, I just go, no. Well, we haven't asked the question. I said, no. Can we lose the hat? I go, no, that's like, why you hire me? And then I tell them, I'll leave or you shoot with a hat. And then of course they do. It's <laughs> true. I love it. I love it. It's a point of contention. <laughs> Every time they do it. I mean, my, my agent will put it in the contract. He is, you know, will he will appear in the hat. That's his trademark. And they'll kind of change it. We will most probably let him wear it's like you're wearing i'm wearing it or i won't, won't right. learn anything oh yeah <laughs> if there was a challenge coin made it would be you with the hat you can't like it let go yeah. of it yeah especially at this point it's just the thing it's like people you know some people will laugh about that or and then it's a joke like if i'm a cryptozoologist i gotta have a hat but you know it's just it's just a thing you know no i Believe me, the amount of research you've done and the time and stuff you put towards this field, I think you wear whatever you want, whatever you want. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we let you go and stuff, uh, Lyle, this has been great. Uh, where can people buy your hot sauce, social media, stuff like that? Tell us about where we can kind of reach out to you and find out what you're doing. And what you got coming up, if you have anything. Yeah. Right. Um lyleblackburn.com is the place to go for all the information um i've got a shop link on there where you can buy stuff directly from me books t-shirts and the hot sauce it's really kind of the only place you can get it it's carried in some retail locations but there's a link on there i'll tell you where that is if you happen to be out and about it in the in the usually bigfoot museums and places like that i'll carry it um and uh you can also get my books on amazon of course, and uh, Ghoul Town Music is available wherever finer music is sold, iTunes, Bandcamp, Amazon, everywhere, YouTube, you know, stream it. Um, and uh, there's links at liveblackburn.com to all that stuff. So wow. coming up, I've got some event appearances. It seems like the fall kind of started got rolling with having more things around the country, although the Mothman Festival just got canceled. I was a supposed to speak at that but you know covid's up and down so there is there's a list of things so i'm about ready to get out and do do some events um and then sort of i've been working on a book project slowly but surely kind of as, as i've been going i kind of i put two books out last year so i took a a bit of a breather for a while did the monster sauce thing like yeah. and now i'm kind of back to now it's become like which book do i write because i get out this list and it's like 15 titles long I, where, which one do i write <laughs> so, yeah yeah but uh always always working on a book so love it well uh again thank you josh for wanting to be out here and thank you lyle for coming on spirit talk and uh this was a blast and we'll have to do it again absolutely enjoyed absolutely, it yeah awesome thank you Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You. Thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you like what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, 
other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week.